The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts, this is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And the show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists tonight. Uh, first up, returning after a little bit of a hiatus, we've got the host of the God and Guns podcast, church security team leader, firearms instructor, oath keeper, former FFL, farmer, husband, father, grandfather. It's Troy Clopton. What's up, man? How you doing? Good. Glad to have you back, buddy. Glad to be here. Uh, next up, uh, we had a last minute substitution. Uh, you probably know his name or have heard his name. He's a producer all over the Firearms Radio Network and host of the Off Road Podcast and a gun guy behind the counter at Rainier Arms. His name is Ben Allred. What's up, buddy? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Glad to have you both here. Uh, before we get started, go check out the Patriot Patch Company. That's patriotpatch.co. Patch of the Month Club is what I would recommend. And second call defense. If you have a gun, carry a gun, you may someday use a gun for self defense. It's good to have a very inexpensive insurance product to make sure that uh, everything is covered, whether it's uh, bond, bail, criminal defense, civil defense, damages, both criminal and civil, uh, all kinds of other stuff. They cover it all for about the cost of two cups of coffee a month at Starbucks. So go check them out as well. And that's firearmsradio.tv slash SCD. Let's get right into the stories. First up, we got Tennessee counties are starting to join the 2A sanctuary movement. Uh, we've seen this a lot. They're... If, uh, if I recall correctly, oh, autoplay, if I recall correctly, there's over a hundred counties just in Virginia that have claimed say, or that have voted for sanctuary county status. And now we're starting to see it in Tennessee. And I think that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. Tennessee is not a place that you would think would be a, a whole lot of danger to gun rights, but I don't think that anywhere is safe anymore. Troy, what do you think? Uh, well, we're doing it here in Kentucky. We've got 101 counties already in just well, since pretty much Christmas that have brought in sanctuary um, county status against us, any kind of infringement on the Second Amendment. Our county went, uh, voted uh, 5-0 uh, and went through. We had a full courthouse uh, here in Kentucky. I mean, here in LaRue County, and I live in, um, and it's everywhere else in the state except for your liberal bastions like Louisville, Lexington, where the you know, college towns have been really where you had a pushback. I think Evansville has been a little bit difficult, but even those are going to look, looks like they're going to go and go ahead and be sanctuary county. So it's, it's hitting here. I, I think it's happening in, in Missouri and Mississippi. I think some other uh, states are doing that as well because we had a Democrat governor elected in their last election. Uh, which was really close. It was within like a thousand votes or something. Dang man. So, I mean, it's mostly symbolic, right? Like these aren't going to preempt state or federal laws and probably not going to really do a whole lot of good, but it is kind of a way for counties to stand up for their citizens. Ben, what say you? Uh, we've, we've essentially kind of got that, uh, in a few places here in Washington with like 1639 where the sheriff said, Hey, we're not going to enforce it. Eventually, essentially that is a sanctuary county and I'm, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, at least they're not basically making other laws that are going to infringe on all of our rights and freedom. So if they're doing this, then they're not doing other things that may, may turn out bad. The, Really, uh, going back to Kentucky here, we've got an actual law in the books that local municipalities cannot make any laws that infringe upon the Second Amendment and it's state level law. And the, the anti-gunners are trying to use that law as justification that they can't say that they're a sanctuary city because then they'll be breaking the law. I'm like, no, that's the absolute opposite of your argument, but. Not to take up the whole time here on that, but you know, I, I think that it's, it's Virginia has lit the fire under a lot of people to make a stand. And, uh, and when you have huge numbers show up at the local courthouse where you usually have 10 people show up for a meeting and you've got hundreds of people showing up, uh, they're not likely to try to propose any gun legislation going forward. I don't think. Yeah, definitely keep up the great work, guys. 
Next story is an uh, interesting one. So a uh, pizza delivery driver shoots three out of four robbery suspects. So he's delivering a pizza. It's late at night. He's in an apartment complex. He gets approached by four individuals who point what he thinks is an assault weapon at his head. Uh, so have you guys seen the Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Uh, Danny DeVito meme where he's like, so anyways, I started blasting. Uh, but that's when the driver pulled out his own pistol, fired at the suspects, causing them to flee the scene. Uh, officers quickly tracked down three of the suspects and two of them had gunshot wounds. A fourth was located at a nearby hospital. All three wounded suspects are expected to survive. Uh, the, the criminals were a 15 and a 16 year old, an 18 and a 20 year old. And it looks like they had a toy rifle painted to look like a real firearm, but play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Ben. And that, here's your trophy guys. Cause that is one big stupid prize. <clears throat> exactly. Lead poisoning delivered hot and fast. Uh, Troy, what are your thoughts? Well, I think he needs some more training so that they would not have had to been witnesses, but, uh, <laughs> I think that, you know, uh, that's pretty good to get three out of four, uh, on a jump a surprise attack in, in dark, uh, late night delivery. So uh, good for him. Uh, I hope he keeps his job and then, then get sued. We'll see. Yeah. And I, I have to wonder, I mean, when, a, when a criminal does something stupid like this and gets a cat busted in them, uh, do they, do they go do stupid things like that again? Or do you think that it makes them, uh, do you think it makes them think about it maybe a little more before they do something else? I think it depends upon where they live and how smart they are. Yeah. Or where they got shot. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh man. Uh, let's see. Next story is rifle hunting season for deer in Wisconsin may get extended. So this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, this proposal is on the table to more than double the length of, uh, the gun deer hunting season. It was in Wisconsin. It would extend the season to 19 days and they're doing it to attract more gun hunters to the sport. So clearly hunting is a big Wisconsin tradition here. And the current season is nine days. It would extend it to 19 days. It's going to affect, I believe, archery and crossbow. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, archery and crossbow seasons as well. But this is not a bad idea. Uh, especially if they have a huge, huge deer population there and need some of that. Troy, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, I agree with you that the, the, it really should be driven by how much need they did they have for reducing the population. If, if they have a high population, they, they need to extend the seasons, all of them, uh, to be fair as, as much as you could. Uh, but I think the, also we're talking about the demographic of hunters are getting older mm -hmm. and they're not as likely to be out, out with a bow as they would be with, uh, with a rifle maybe. Yeah, I totally agree. Ben, that's the, that was exactly what I was going to bring up is I think that it is true. And I think that we're seeing as we see, all across the nation that hunting is maybe uh, diminishing a bit in popularity. And when we talk about the conference conservation and all the great that it does, that's a bad thing, but making it a little bit longer, making it a little bit easier for, uh, for that younger j generation to get involved. Um, I think is a good thing, Ben. Uh, you know, I, I've tried getting into hunting here in Washington and the cost with it too. And then you're limited to essentially a week, uh, jump, uh, bumping it up to two weeks, close to three weeks. Yeah, that would probably make it a lot easier for someone to take the time off and go out and go hunt it because uh, time is money, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, next story, New Jersey Supreme Court rules in favor of gun rights. I thought this was from uh, The Onion or something, but no, it's actually from Ammo Land, which is good news. So overturning both a county superior court and an appellate division decision, the law firm of Evan F. Knapp and attorney at law successfully petitioned the New, New Jersey Supreme Court for a unanimous opinion released today mandating that people must be provided with hearings whenever a court contemplates de denying a handgun carry permit and that such hearings must be held within 30 days. Uh, bolded here, it says, if a court, this is from the uh, New Jersey Supreme Court, if a court has any questions regarding the applicant or his or her permit to carry application, it must hold a hearing to address those questions. The court should not simply deny the application. So they've also uh, released guidance and uh I think this is actually pretty great. And not only that, but it was unanimous as well. Troy. Well, yeah, I think that, um, Evan's been, been great in New Jersey trying to push her through a lot of these lawsuits. And, uh, uh, this one in particular is, is good because I mean, the judges are essentially just setting on, 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 on the uh, permits, not letting them go through. And, uh, this is going to say that, Hey, they've got to reply yay or no nay within 30 days and they have the right to appeal it. So, that that is uh, that should be the way the court system should work. It's it's sad that they have to go through that many hoops, um, but at least it's moving in the right direction. Yeah, definitely a great deal, Ben. 
Yeah, it, it, it's a good, great step in constitutional law. I mean, your right to appeal. If the judge is going to tell me no, I have a right to appeal it, and let's make it quick and speedy, right? Right. Yeah, at the very least, not just appeal, at the very least a hearing. Uh, don't just deny it and then close the book and throw the folder away. Actually, give me a chance to understand why it went wrong, what went wrong, and, you know, the opportunity to fix any bad things that may, that may have happened. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, um, our co-host, uh, Doug has, has got a lawsuit with Evan Happen, uh, representing him in New Jersey, uh, because he in Georgia has a court ordered permit as opposed to Kentucky, we're constitutional carrier, then we have a state, uh, we have um, uh, state police issues, the, the permits here. But in, in Georgia, they have a uh, court ordered permit to carry. And so, so does New Jersey. And so there's this, uh, because they are both court ordered, New Jersey is required to honor any court ordered permits or licenses from other states. And they have not been allowing them to do that with gun permits. Hmm. And so they have, uh, Doug and another person has, uh, joined in this lawsuit against New Jersey so that he would be able to carry using his Georgia permit since it's a court ordered one as, in, as opposed to a state issued one. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. That's all kinds of interesting things going on in New Jersey. It's not often that we have good news coming out of there, uh, for sure. So, uh, Moving on to some uh, different news. This is not something that we normally cover on this show or something that I normally cover, but I think it's kind of important. But uh, Bloomberg pledged $60 million to turn the U.S. just like he did Virginia. This comes to us from Bearing Arms. And it uh, looks like he's already spent more than $200 million just in his bid for the Democratic presidential nomination. But now he's also promised an additional, uh, what was it, an additional, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, Six, shot 60. show plague. Yeah, $60 million, uh to basically help get more anti-gun candidates elected around the country in this election cycle. Uh, and this is clearly uh, part of a greater plan. Shannon Watts says that the, this massive 2020 effort is fueled by a combination of financial resources, unprecedented grassroots power, and a consensus among more than 90% of Americans across party lines that we need action now to reduce gun violence. Uh, yeah, she is a, she's a hoot. But yeah, congrats. So- Roots, huh? Yeah, this this is bad, and let's not forget that I believe thirty million is what the NRA put into the last election cycle that we saw Trump elected the president of the United States. And uh, when you think about the amount of money that is, uh, it's kind of crazy. Now Bloomberg is going to have a sixty second Bloomberg ad at the Super Bowl, which cost about ten million dollars. And uh, Trump and the Republican National Committee have also built up a pretty unprecedented war chest. And are planning to deploy some of that for their own Super Bowl ad, valued at $10 million. Uh, it's going to be a wild ride uh, the next little bit here, guys. What do you think, Ben? Well, considering I watch Hulu and every other ad is a Bloomberg ad, <laughs> you don't vote for just about anyone else. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense, Troy. Well, uh, the thing that Bloomberg is doing uh, that I've read in another article regarding his spending on uh, advertising, he's buying up all the available time. So... He's buying up the whole market with this amount of purchase. And so he's going to control who gets to, who gets, ad, whose ads get seen. Uh, that he's putting so much money into it. I think that they said he would go up to spend as much as $2 billion. $2 billion is a lot of money <laughs> to spend uh, on all, of, you know, on all of his campaigning. So I'm thinking that it's going to be hard for anyone else to buy any advertisement on, on the regular advertisement markets you know as i understand it doesn't the fcc have the equal time rule which basically specifies that radio and television broadcast uh has to provide equal time for both both parties i no, i know equal time rule does exist uh it's been a thing that's been around since actually i just pulled it up here uh 1927 superseded by the communications act of 1934 uh, requires what's that i was thinking it was mostly repealed could be, I guess, but I thought that it was still a thing because I mean, yeah, I don't know if anyone out there knows, I would, I would love to find out, but yeah, I thought equal time rule was kind of a thing that existed. So it'd be interesting if he was purchasing up all that. Yeah. As I understood, that was sort of his game plan. He was planning on owning all of the marketing time available as much as he could purchase, uh, which, which would really 
you know, knock out everybody else if he already owned, pre, pre-bought all that time, which I, I can see the media allowing him to, to do that. Yeah. And that's the thing. Do you see how much power that gives an individual, uh, the, the riches that that, that that individual can then use to exert a power? I mean, if you could buy all the available slots and fill them with your message, let's not forget there's a lot of sheep out there and the, they're going to, whatever they see on TV, they're going to believe and they're going to take it into account. And yeah, that's, it's pretty terrifying. It's a battle between the elites, which are few numbers, but have a lot of money. And we, the people who are the majority, uh, we have probably more money combined as a nation that are conservative or, or American patriotic people. But there's so much apathy and so much just, uh, people just don't want to get involved. They just don't care that they, they, they're burnt out and, uh, they don't really, they don't really get involved or engaged. Uh, yeah, engagement is a huge thing. I mean, to be fair, we do probably have more money as, uh, you know, as a nation than these individuals, but do we have more money that we can spend on things, frivolous right. things like elections? Like Bloomberg, I mean, clearly he is extraordinarily rich, but he can spend a ton of it because he probably doesn't need a ton to live on. I mean, if, if he came and lived my lifestyle, can you imagine how much money he could just throw at whatever cause he decided to champion? Mm-hmm. And his friends are just as rich and just as, uh, influential. And, you know, so you get, you've got a cabal of elites that are spending a lot of money to try to make us slaves again. I'm going to become seriously, seriously anti-gun, get him to donate tons of his money to the foundation that I start. And then I'm a flip flop and come back to pro gun and use all that money for the good of the second amendment. He'll stick Hillary on you. <laughs> oh, God. Shallow grave. For the record, I did not commit suicide. <laughs> NRA reportedly got favors from the Trump administration. This comes to us from The Guardian and is written exactly as the as such. Uh, basically talks about fall of 2017, an NRA lobbyist named Benjamin Cassidy left his job at the, at the NRA and uh, was immediately given a job at the U.S. Interior Department dealing with external uh, requests and things like that. Looks like he leveraged some of that, uh, reached out to the NRA for advice on a lot of things. And then it looks like at some point later on, he basically said, oh, there's ethics bans and things like that. So I can't deal with you guys anymore. Please reach out to someone else in this department. And then even further ended up leaving under questionable circumstances and then going and uh, joining the Safari Club as a pretty high ranking <laughs> official. And I I don't know. It, I try to put this in the situation like because it is something that I agree with, it's not really that big of a deal. But what if it was something I really disagreed with? You know, what if he used that and became and used that that government appointed position to push issues that I disagree with? And that makes me think, oh, yeah, that's probably a pretty bad thing. They didn't really show any evidence here that that I was like, oh, yeah, that's complete mismanagement. They just, it looks like people being appointed to the IWCC, the International Wildlife Conservation Council. I don't know. I, I tried to look at it with uh, objective eyes and I didn't see anything here. Apparently there is an investigation going, an internal investigation going on, but he's already long gone from the position. Um, I don't know. It, I, I don't know if it's just them going after, uh, someone who is friendly to conservative policies, movements and, uh, morals and ethics or, or if he was doing something bad, Ben, what do you think? You know, it, it, it's kind of interesting to see if I would like to see the whole story. Uh, like, did he just, Hey, I, I know you, you know me, Hey, they're opening. Hey, there's a job. It, or is it, or was there, Hey, I'll help you win this presidency. Give me, give me a job now. More likely the latter or the earlier one. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough to say. I mean, I try to look at this with objective eyes, but then it's coming from a very unobjective media organization, The Guardian. Uh, so, Troy, did you read this one? What, what did you yeah, think? I read it. Uh, to me, it looked like uh, just another article as sort of a hit piece against the NRA that there's some kind of evil uh, group of people that uh, are in, infesting the government now that they're Trump's buddies. But – it's it's completely moronic to me because if you look at all the of the politicians and all of the uh, people who are leaving uh, government, getting college professor 
internships and getting uh, news anchor jobs and news reporter jobs. Uh, you know, it's sort of incestuous on the left, how they all just sort of move in and out of government, move into these different uh, nonprofit groups and then move right back into government again and other positions. You know, it's just, it's just politics through the media as far as I'm considered. Uh, it's what comes across to me. I mean, there's no, there's no evidence he actually did anything wrong that I can find anywhere here. Yeah, even the stuff that they were speculating, I was like, that just seems like someone who is in a position reaching out to someone that he considers an expert on the matter for advice or guidance or whatever it happens to be. I don't know. I think if we just get rid of all lobbying, that makes the world a better place. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I also just, well, I'll let it go. No, I'm with you, dude. I, I, <laughs> I understand the pros and the cons the behind it. Coin there, the flip side of that. Yeah, speaking of the flip side, let's talk about the flip side of sanity. California Congresswoman wants to change multiple gun sales reporting. So let me try to lay this down as briefly as I possibly can. So right now, as an FFL, and Troy, you know this as a uh, former FFL, uh, anytime there is a sale of a pistol or a revolver, more than one pistol or revolver in a five business day period, that the FFL, the Federal Firearms Licensee, is required to submit a multiple firearm sales report to the ATF and I believe the chief law enforcement officer of their area or whatever it happens to be. That then goes to the ATF. The ATF has this, and they use that data sometimes to uh, prosecute crimes of straw purchases and things like that. It's not rifles. It's not shotguns. It's just pistols and revolvers. So I did a little bit of research before this, trying to find out, because a lot of times they will have retention policies for those for those forms. They, like the ATF can only keep these, on, these on, on file for a certain amount of time or anything like that. But as I understand it, there is no... Uh, there is no time that they have to get rid of those reports. Whereas the 4473, whenever we do a background check through the NICS system, uh, which is the FBI, uh, for a firearms purchase, they have to dump those within 24 or 48 hours. So they're not allowed to keep it and there is no gun registration that they can just go search a database and see who has a gun at any given time. With the multiple firearms reports, it doesn't appear that there is any retention policy on that. So it goes to the ATF. They can then put that in whatever database they choose, and that's how they track down some of these crimes. But it also takes away a little bit of the freedom by being a de facto gun registry. So this lady, uh, Norma Torres, Democrat from California, uh, it is the Multiple Firearms Sales Reporting Modernization Act of 2019. Under the current, uh, I just explained the current law. Uh, she wants it expanded to all firearms, including rifles and shotguns of any type. Uh, in a press release issued the day the legislation was issued, she claims that this is a common sense solution to make communities safer. She makes a big deal about modern multi-purpose semi-auto firearms. And I know a lot of people would be like, oh, that makes sense. That doesn't seem like a bad thing. But I see it as a de facto gun registration policy uh, in addition to all the other things here. And – we already have a lot of laws in the books against straw purchases and all these other things, and they're against the law. We aren't we aren't going after the criminals who do these things. We're not enforcing them enough. Ben, what do you think on this one? Uh, j just from like behind the counter type guy, uh, there's so many times I have customers come in and they buy like, hey, I'm going to buy three or four receivers. It's a really good deal. N now the government's tracking them. Yeah, no, thank you. Any Anytime some politician says common sense, it's not common sense. Well, a receiver is is other, so it it's not doesn't qualify for but, a multiple. But she doesn't want to expand that. Though. Oh, no, she does, yeah. No, it, she but wants to expand it to everything, yeah. No, I agree, actually. Completely agree. Uh, let me throw one more wrinkle in this uh, that, as I was explained by my ATF agent that did my inspection or my interview, he said that it's five of my business days. So a lot of at-home FFLs, uh, not me, I've got business hours every day, but a lot of at-home FFLs will only list one or two days a week that they're open. And that means that if someone buys it from them, it has to be five of their business days, which means two, four, six, so over three weeks. So if someone buys two guns, two pistols or revolvers over three weeks, that they're required to fill out a multiple uh, firearm purchase form. Troy? Yeah, it's just another, um, you know, chipping the wall. They're just trying to keep chipping away until they can get full on registration of their guns. And, and, you know, that's their ultimate goal. I mean, ideally these, these documents uh, should be sent to Jeffrey Epstein's prison so they can be lost forever because we know Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this next story is awful. A uh, pistol packing dad has an ND that killed his four-year-old son. This comes to us from WDRB.com in Indiana. 
And it's just kind of a, it's a tragic story. So they're play wrestling. Guy has a gun tucked into his waistband, uh, small of the back carry. Uh, they're playing. The gun falls and a shot was fired, hitting both the father and the son in the head. Uh, the son was critically injured and did pass away. And the father will recover from his injuries. These stories, I, I don't think we have a whole lot to talk about on them, except for to say, get a holster, yeah. have the right holster. Uh, Troy, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's just basic gun safety. Get a good retention holster. But first of all, don't be wrestling with your kid with a gun on. Uh, I mean, if you're going to wrestle, get down on the floor and play with the kids and stuff, you, you got to put that gun up. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just tragedy. I mean, it, 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 these things happen, but, you know, hindsight is always easy to, you know, play baseball from, you know, <laughs> make the call after the fact, but, uh, it, you know, just be safe, guys. It's, yeah. You're just, uh, you're putting your, your family's lives in your hand when you do that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Ben? Well, as a father, I'd imagine that father wish that he would have died too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just in that moment, you know, I, I feel for the guy. It's very unfortunate. It does. Uh, is this an inappropriate time to ask if it was a SIG P320? Oh. Just because, I mean, it fell and went off. I, I don't know if the father tried to catch it. We all know the rule. Don't try to catch a falling gun <laughs> unless it's a P320. That, that's the, the, the fifth safety rule yeah. right there. Yeah. Tough, tough tragic for that family but more evidence that we should all be uh very considerate about how we choose to carry and responsible okay. with it with it as such red flag law introduced in tennessee we talked earlier about sanctuary counties and cities and things like that but now we're actually seeing uh, a tennessee lawmaker filing a red flag bill to allow temporary removal of guns for at-risk owners uh, they allow family members household members intimate partners or law enforcement to petition to temporarily confiscate guns we've seen it all over the United States, uh, some places like my dear home here in Colorado have, uh, have put them in place and they've already, already been abused and we've talked about it on the show, but Ben, are you surprised? No, I'm not. I, I, it's, it's like, it's like the magazine capacity thing that's hitting my state. Once it goes to one state, it, it spreads like a bad virus and there, there's just not enough Tylenol that can be taken to, to take down that temperature. Yeah. Troy? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's being introduced everywhere they can. I mean, they, they're not winning at the federal level, so they've moved to the states and local municipalities where they're able to. Uh, they've introduced that here in Kentucky, but it never made a committee. And there's the Kentucky Senate and House is both, uh, dominated by Republicans, but you know, another election cycle that could all change. So, but the lo- one that was introduced right after the first of the year was, uh, it was never even brought out a committee. It, it failed here. Yeah. Gun control laws. Continue to move forward in Virginia. So the Virginia House Committee has passed a bunch of them. Uh, let's see here. Universal background checks. We know those don't work at all, as we've seen in Washington and Colorado. Uh, also passed a bill allowing local municipalities to enact gun bans for certain areas, whether the state legislature enacts such bans or not. Uh, they allow local municipalities to ban concealed carry in parks and public buildings. Uh, all kinds of other stuff going on there and we can we can talk about this but Troy, i'd like to you went to lobby day in virginia on january 20th uh why don't you kind of lay it down for us what was it like well uh we i arrived sunday uh drove in and sunday and got there and late in the evening went down and looked around at the well as i was around through looked at the the police set up there was police cars staged everywhere uh, when we got the hotel, I'd say probably half the guys in the hotel, families in the hotel were there for the gun lobby. The other half were there for some kind of volleyball tournament. <laughs> but everybody was very positive. They were very, uh, they were very upbeat. They were very, uh, uh, excited about the next day. And then the, the next morning, the, the same thing. And we we're getting breakfast and, the, and everybody was seemed to be upbeat and ready to go. And we walked down there. We were only about half a mile from the Capitol or hotel. We walked in and, uh, it was, uh, it was already filling up and that was at like 7.30 in the morning when we were walking down in there. And, uh, by nine o'clock, I, I met up with, uh, Stuart Rhodes, uh, president of Oath Keepers and I met up with several Oath Keepers guys and they were trying to rally. Well, they couldn't get in. The traffic was so heavy that they couldn't even get into the area uh, until like two hours after the event started. Oh, wow. 
because there's so many people trying to get in and they were parking him at, at uh, off-site parking and busing them in and they just couldn't get everybody in. I mean, even after the event was over with, we still had Oath Keeper guys that still couldn't get in. And, uh, and it filled up, you know, the police had so many different streets blocked off that you were really much, pretty much funneled into like two streets going up to the Capitol and you couldn't really get, couldn't really hear anything. They had helicopters over the top circling. So the helicopter noise along with the, with Alex Jones riding around in an armored car with a loudspeaker yelling and, and everybody chanting and stuff. It was a, it was a loud atmosphere. Uh, but it was all peaceful. Everybody were, were uh, happy that, that others were there. They were all, you know, shocked at how many people showed up. I think had there not been so many people show up, I think it would have been, it could have been a bad day. I think bad things could happen. But even though it was 20 degrees and wind was blowing 15 miles an hour, people were standing out there the whole time. Uh, people were walking in. There was elderly guys that were war, war vets in wheelchairs being rolled in there and, uh, yeah, it was a very positive event. I think that, uh, it debunked everything the governor had said about it. I never really felt threatened because I never went inside of the fenced in area. I mean, not that you could even get in there if you wanted to because it was completely packed as well as all the streets leading into it was so packed. You could never even got in there. And as we were leaving, uh, people were still trying to get in. People were coming in like, is it over? We're, we just got here. We walked two miles. We walked three miles. We, we had to park. Because the governor had somehow influenced the, the the local people who ran the parking garages to shut down all the parking garages down around the capital, so people didn't have anywhere to park. They had to park way off way off site. Uh, those jackasses. Yeah, it was it was pathetic. Crazy, uh, Ben. I mean, it's no big surprise that uh, Virginia is passing a lot of these bills that they proposed, and you know, I think we're going to continue to see it. Virginia is. Uh, I know there's lots of patriots there. It's a tough time for them. Uh, I'm waiting to see the Hawaiian shirts. Uh, it's <laughs> nearing it, right? You would think. You would think. All right. Uh, next story. Uh, Troy, by the way, thank you for going. That's amazing. Yes. Thank, thanks for being represented. I, I, I just felt like it was a moment we had to take a stand, and I'm close enough. I mean, you guys are a long ways off, but uh, there were people there from California. There were people there from Colorado. Uh, I had a few friends from here in Washington fly yeah, out for That's awesome. So, yeah. There was uh, Florida. There was people from New York. There was a there was a actually a FFL owner uh, there with a 50 BMG. Yeah, slung over his shoulder. A New York a gun gun uh, uh, store owner. Uh, the firing pin, I believe, is the name of his store. Oh, okay, he he's internet famous now because of that. <laughs> yeah, everybody yeah. was getting their picture made with him. Uh, and there was people from all races. All, all you know, there was women. There was probably thirty, twenty, thirty percent women. There was you know, it was a big turnout. Uh, I was just really surprised at the demographics of the group. It was just broad and in all age groups. People there with their whole kids, families. Uh, it was a, it was a good it was a good thing. Awesome, man. Good stuff. Uh, this is from the Keep Your Head on the Swivel Files. Mi- Mississippi police officer shot in the head during gu- a traffic stop by motorist who pulled up alongside him. So he pulls somebody over for something. A uh, green truck stops, completely unrelated to it. Guy gets out with a knife. Officer orders him to drop it. Uh, guy's like, you know what? Let me go back to the car or to the truck and get a shotgun. They mentioned multiple times in the article that the officer moved to get the stopped vehicle, vehicle out of the line of fire. Uh, if that's the case, that's pretty awesome and good thinking on his part. Mm-hmm. And then they exchanged gunfire. Officer was struck in the head. Suspect was also hit twice. Looks like they're both going to live. That's good. But geez, just like doing a routine traffic stop and bada bing, bada boom, gunfight. Troy? Yeah, I, it's good that the officer got the other party out of the way, but uh, it's, a, it's a matter of that. Darn if you do, darn if you don't. Go ahead and shoot the guy when he's threatening you with a knife. I mean, once you threaten and, and lethal force has been established, I think that he should have shot him at that point before he ever let him get back in the car to get that shotgun. But, you know, I'm not a cop and I don't really know everything, but I wouldn't let anybody go back to the car to get a shotgun after they started at me with a knife. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ability, opportunity, and jeopardy, those three things definitely seem like they were in play. But I think that cops, honestly, and Troy, you and I talked about it before the show, there's yeah. been a lot of attacks on cops, or at least we're seeing a lot more. I don't know if the statistics bear that out, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a, kind of a crazy time. Ben, what are your thoughts? 
Let me play CNN reporter here. Well, on the scene here, he should have shot him in the leg or you just <laughs> No. Yeah, why couldn't he tase him? Yeah, why do, why couldn't you just tase him? No, really. He, the, I, I think when the cop was threatened with the knife, it probably would have been the perfect time to shoot him. But again... I, I'm not there to play quarterback for him. So, well, yeah. you know, the legality of, of being a police officer these days where they're going to get sued no matter what they do, uh, and their job's in jeopardy. I mean, I, you know, he's got all these second guesses going on in the back of his brain. It shouldn't be that way. You know? No, it shouldn't be. But that, that's a little way. Life. Go ahead. It, it, it's his life to go home with, right? Right. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, a guy comes at you with a knife. We know the tooler drill. We know that 21 feet kind of inside that is, is dangerous. We know that knife fights are literally kind of the worst thing you could possibly imagine. Uh, you know, you, what, what they say in the Irishman, you, you rush a shooter, but you run from, uh, from a knife. Mm-hmm. I, I, I totally agree. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad the officer survived, but that guy had a knife. Uh, if he intimated an attack, if the officer thought that he, the guy had the ability, that he had the opportunity and that the officer's life is in jeopardy, I hate the fact that sometimes they have to they have to take all these uh, other equations into fact into uh, into account and not do it. In L.A. or in in California, the laws are going against cops all the time. Uh, they're making it to where they can't use lethal force or engage in lethal force. And while I understand some of the problems that they're trying to fix, like that's these are all kind of outliers. They're, this is not how most uh, LAPD cops are. It's just every now and then. A cop will do a bad thing, but how many times do they do great things? And that's not what gets rewarded. But now they can't even hire enough cops in California, and it's good. we're going to see it all over the country. All right. Smart guns for stupid reporters. Vice reporter points gun at cameraman and pulls triggers. Pulls trigger. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, this was a dumb video. So they're doing a, a piece on how smart guns will uh, show how they will stop accidental shooting. So he takes a Thompson with a magazine and it, points it at the cameraman, pulls the trigger, and then says... I didn't think it was going to do that. Like, oh, oh God, what what an idiot, Ben. Oh, I, I, I'm just cringing. I, I we're working at a gun counter, and uh, every time someone's like, "Oh, can I pull the trigger?" I'm like, uh, "In a safe direction, please." Yeah, yeah, ground, ceiling, like not anywhere at or at a person. It's just yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, I love that the reporter is getting out there, and you know trying to ply people with something he knows nothing about. I'm like, if you don't know anything about guns, maybe don't pick it up. You want to do your report? You want to report the truth? You want to report the news without any bias? That's great. Picking it up, picking up the gun, pointing at your cameraman and pulling the trigger. That's just, uh, that's looking for negligence. Troy. Yeah. I mean, it's all shock value kind of things that the media does these days to try to make people afraid of guns. Who knows what the true intent was, but the whoever owned the gun or was responsible for the guns there should have coached that reporter ahead of time uh, and been standing close enough to stop that. Uh, it's my opinion. I mean, you're responsible for the people in your store. If you're going to let them handle the gun, you're close enough that you can knock it away or you can, you know, have them point in a safe direction, uh, coach them or whatever. But, you know, yeah. people that, that all, all they know about guns is what they see on the movies. That's the way they act. Yeah, for sure. And I guarantee if that reporter, if someone had accidentally left a round in that mag and that reporter had negligently killed his cameraman, that they would blame it on the gun. And the store. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you should have let us have that thing. <laughs> From the do as I say peasant files, Florida Republican lawmakers moved to exempt themselves from CCW bans in the state. Yep, you heard me right. They, uh, they want to exert their authority and kingship, uh, over the citizens of Florida. So it's been introduced uh, by, it was House Bill 183 by Rep. Mel Ponder, Republican, and Senate Bill 1524 introduced by Senator George Gaynor, uh, both titled Prohibited Places for Weapons and Firearms. Number seven in there says any meeting of a governing body of a county public school uh, district, municipality, or special district, but they changed it and added, and I'm going to read this nice and dramatically because it's very important. Except that nothing in this section precludes an elected member of the governing body of a county, public school district, municipality, or special district licensed under this section from carrying a concealed weapon or firearm to a meeting of the governing body of which he or she is a member. So this says politicians, they have the rights and that they want to take from their own citizenry because they are better people and uh, they deserve to uh, have authority and control over the peasants beneath them, uh, the serfs beneath them, I should say. Uh, ben, uh, 
is is this as much BS as I'm making it out to be, or am I just off base here? No, this is complete BS. Any uh, realistically, I'd like to see any law that's written applies to everyone across the board. That way, there's more fight against it. Magazine bans. There is no exempt for military or, or law enforcement. That way, then it turns around. Oh, that is a bad idea because they need those. Yeah, we toss. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but if you're going to do it, go hard, hard straight across the line. There is no exceptions. Yeah, we we toss the monarchy a hard L in 1776. I have no desire to go back to it, Troy. Yeah, I'm agreement. It's just another. Um, we're we're more qualified than you. Kind of a statement. But, you know, I think that the answer is, you know, all laws should apply to all citizens and all security team members of their detail as well. So if you're going to limit uh, the citizenry, you're going to limit your own people as well. Yeah, and I, I fully believe that whatever police officers, military, whatever they have access to, citizens should have the right to the same. There should be no exception uh, because of what they do for a living. Right. And this is this is one of the most egregious things that I have seen. This is fully a, a monarchy mentality that we are more important than the people who should who put us here and put us in office. No, they work for us. They need to re- they need to remember that, and we need to remove the people from office that think they are on a different playing field. Exactly. Oh, from the truth about guns, I, I kind of debated even doing this story because I do not think that this is written very well. I think they jumped to a lot of conclusions here, but the headline says Delaware bill can make an FFL necessary for all residents. And, you know, I, I think maybe past me wouldn't have even read it, but current me and, and probably future me believes that, uh, that they are out to get us. Uh, Delaware House Bill 277 is, well, they say one of the unintentional funniest bits of legislation they've seen here. Uh, the House Majority Leader Valerie Longhurst has submitted this, but basically, uh, she says the bill establishes the crime of possession of an unfinished firearm frame or receiver with no serial number possession and manufacturing a covert or undetectable firearm already illegal possessing possession and of ma- sorry, possession of and manufacturing an untraceable firearm and manufacturing or distributing a firearm using a three dimensional printer. This also makes it a crime to possess a firearm frame or receiver with a removed, obliterated or altered serial number. Uh, so basically they're saying there's a, there's a lot of inaccuracies in this and horrible knowledge and stuff, but uh, no person shall knowingly transport, ship, transfer, or sell an unfinished firearm frame or receiver unless all the following apply. The person is a federally licensed gun dealer. So the author of this story, because of that clause in this, is saying that anyone who has access to a lead pipe or a 2 by 4 or PVC or anything else that you could make your own firearm in your garage, because don't forget, people, that we are allowed to manufacture our own firearms, not for sale, but for personal use in the United States. And it's been that way uh, for a very, very, very long time. But the way this is written, because of its, it, because it's overly broad, that anything that possibly could be turned into, it has to be an FFL, which would basically mean that any person at the state would probably have to have an FFL. I don't know. Troy, what do you think? Well, it's just a jargon. I mean, she doesn't, or whoever put this bill forward, doesn't know anything about farms terminology technology i mean the class of license would have to be a manufacturer it wouldn't be just a regular ffl so it's a special license which is what three grand a year or more so uh it's just letting democrats loose is a bad idea yeah (laughs) ben i want to know who who who's under the mask because that looks like someone from white chicks (laughs) Uh, you know what good point (laughs) And yeah, I I hate when politicians write stuff bills about stuff they don't understand, and it's just like, come on. Well, it's their aides that write it, and then they just yeah. go out there and put on lipstick and try to push it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a dumb law, and I guess I could see how it could be construed that way. But yeah, I mean, look, we can't vote for dumb laws. Like we have to vote against dumb laws and dumb politicians that try to put them into place. Yeah, until it becomes. Uh, a death sentence, not death sentence, until it becomes a failure to ever be reelected to any office again. Whenever anyone proposes gun legislation, um, it's going to keep on happening and it's going to be a continuous fight. Yep. From the dystopian future files, University of Missouri wants to track all students with an app. So it's required for all student athletes and any other students who are not athletes can have the ability to opt in, but it basically tracks all of their movements. Uh, it's a, just a cell phone that uses GPS to kind of pinpoint where they are at all times. And 
this is not gun related by any means, but it is freedom related. And I thought it'd be interesting to talk about, I say, heck no. And I would advise any of my children that went there or any other people absolutely opt out of this. This is a horrible thing. You don't want, you don't want people that you don't know or give permission to have control over uh data of where you are at any given time. Ben, what do you think? You in? Uh, no, I'm not in. I, I keep seeing this more and more. Um, even my own insurance, my car insurance has a, uh, Hey, install this app on your phone so we can monitor your driving skill and we'll yeah. lower your, give you a bigger discount. Hell no, because I know I drive terribly and I'm not going to give you a chance to make me pay more. <laughs> that, that was me too. I was like, first of all, no, because I don't want double my insurance rates or to be dropped completely. It's yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I don't do not track me at all. I say, as I've got an Alexa listening to every single thing and a Google phone next to me, that's listening to every single thing and Facebook, which is going to show me ads uh, for, for smart guns and probably this app, which is in place at 40 schools, Troy. Oh yeah. It's uh, I mean, most of the apps on your phone now try to track you. You have to turn, go in and physically turn off the location uh, on all these apps or otherwise they're sending you ads for wherever you're standing near or stop to stoplight. Oh, there's a, special sale over at Wendy's if you'd like a frosty or something while you're sitting in a red light. You're like, what in the heck? Yeah. <laughs> so go there and turn that off. So they're tracking you all the time anyway. I mean, the NSA is going to track you because they got chips that they've been playing in since we were more. No. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, what? <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, everything wants to track you now, but it's, it's money. It's money for, I don't think everything that tracks you is about, uh, about government, but I think uh, most of it's about money for these apps being able to say, hey, this person is your demographic and you need to pay us to have this data. And so they're trying to, any, anything that you can get for free as an app, you're probably losing your privacy. Yeah, uh, very okay. much. If you are not purchasing a product and you're right. getting a service for free, you are the product. All right. Uh, uh, you want to go back to a flip phone. <laughs> oh, man. It's just, it's a crazy time to be alive. Arkansas deputy shoots himself in the groin while pocket carrying. This is uh, the this is second story, and I'm bringing this up because I want to kind of p- push this through. So he was pocket carrying a pistol without a holster, put his sunglasses in his pocket while he was at the doctor just doing his doing his business with doing whatever. And it was a 357, and it went off in his pocket, Ooh. and it shot him. And uh, he uh, doesn't look like he's in trouble. He was lawfully uh, in possession of the firearm at the time. No arrest or citation has been made or issued at this at this time. But even when I pocket carry, I carry in a holster mm-hmm. all the time. It doesn't matter. On a holster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, a holster is a holster, and I could put my holster wherever I damn well decide to, as long as I'm responsible with it. But your pocket is not a holster. Your car is not a holster. A holster is a holster, and you have a responsibility to keep that gun secured, safe, and stored securely every single time. Ben, do you pocket carry without a holster? Uh, I, I've pocket carried before, but I had like the little clippy Palmer that went, or not Palmer, uh, uh, Kydex piece that went yeah. over the, trigger to cover the trigger. And then, Hey, I know nothing's going to get in that trigger. And exactly. Still, I mean, oh, that's just terrible. It's like, that could be your nuts. That could be your legs. That could be your foot. Yeah. I don't want to get shot. Is it more <laughs> artery? Yeah. Like he's super lucky that. And he would, he didn't, he declined an ambulance and was just driving. Someone was driving him to the hospital. So that's good. Troy, I mean, what are your thoughts here? Firearms instructor. Yeah. You know, we, we sort of get on a high horse a lot of times at these stories because we're in the industry. We we're around the products. We read the articles. We see all the things that are available out there and we try out a lot of stuff. A lot of the people just don't. And the rally was a perfect example of that. There was a guy that was eating breakfast with us wearing a Don Johnson Miami Vice holster and it kept swinging around and, and flagging me over and over again. Every time he turned around, I'm like, could you, uh, you know, not do that? Yeah. <laughs> I had to finally tell you because this is freaking me out because he had these 45 swinging. A lot of people just don't think. Like the people, like we do in the industry, because we read the stories about people getting shot and growing them, people getting shot. And a lot of the country just aren't that plugged in. And, you know, it's, it's sort of our responsibility to let people know hey, on shows like this, if you're going to carry, put it in a holster, even if it's in your pocket, 
don't put it in your in your band of your pants and don't put it in your shorts or your bra. Uh, put it somewhere that is conceal- covering up that uh, that trigger and uh, make sure you have that secured. Because I, I was at a restaurant. Uh, this was a few years ago, and uh, there was a police officer that was there with his family. He was still in his uniform, and uh, he was like a off duty police officer. Uh, I mean, at that point in time, but, uh, his gun fell out of his holster. Oh my God. Hit his foot and went skidding across the floor towards us on the floor. His four year old son jumps off of his chair, grabs his dad's gun by the handle, picks it up and points at his dad and says, here, dad, pointing the gun right at his dad. Oh my goodness. Uh, I about had a heart attack. I know the, the cop about had a heart attack. He got up and left with his family right after Yeah. That. <laughs> but, those things happen because people aren't being safe. They had a poorly designed holster or a non-retention holster. If you're going to carry, make sure you have a good quality holster that covers it up and it keeps your gun from falling out on the floor and skidding across the floor. So your child jumps down, picks it up, points it at you. You, you have a responsibility as a gun owner that not to be doing stupid stuff. It's that serious stuff. Good God. There, there was a story earlier today too, uh, with a backpack being used as a holster. A backpack's not a holster either, guys. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nope. Oh, boy. All right, enough on that. Virginia Dems want to make criticism of lawmakers illegal. Yeah, you read that correctly, and I actually went to make sure this wasn't from the Babylon Bee. <laughs> but it's not. House Bill 1627, filed by Jeffrey Bourne, a Democrat from District 71, on January 16th, reads, If any person with the intent to coerce, intimidate, or harass any person shall use a computer or computer network to communicate obscene, vulgar, profane, lewd, levi- l- lascivious, or indecent language, or make suggestion of, or proposal of an obscene nature, or threaten any illegal or immoral act, uh, he is guilty of a Class 1 misdemeanor. A violation of this section may be prosecuted in the jurisdiction in which the communication was made or received or in the city of Richmond if the person subjected is subjected to the act as one of the following officials or employees of the Commonwealth. Lists a bunch of people who were uh, greater than the serfs beneath them. But, oh my, what? So now, like, all the people who are angry at the Virginia legislators uh, and, and even Virginia citizens who are have had enough of it like anything can be seen as as taunting or threatening or obscene or indecent uh, or profane or vulgar uh, like this this is the end of the united states when we have things like this out here uh, i i don't say that to be dramatic i say it because these kind of things exist in england and people get thrown in jail for saying something ridiculous like we have freedom of speech for a reason and sometimes freedom of speech is hard and sometimes people say things that hurt our little feelings and it just doesn't really matter, right? We cannot protect our government officials that we put into office to serve us uh, to take away our right to criticize the poor job that they're doing. Troy? Well, I, first thing I want to say under my First Amendment rights is that Jeffrey needs to get a new tie because that is the worst looking tie I've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the whole thing's laughable uh, to us, but... Our First Amendment, uh, if we ever lose our Second Amendment, we won't have a First Amendment. And uh, the the whole thing about the rally was in order to have your First Amendment rights, you had to give up your Second Amendment rights to go inside of the caged area with the Overwatch sniper team looking at you. Uh, These people are are off the rails. I don't know how much money that Bloomberg has given them and Soros has given them. But it's pretty obvious that they are bought and paid for or either lunatics in Virginia. Uh, they are, they're pushing everything they can because they know they're not going to be there long, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is crazy. But I mean, as we see in Colorado, July 1st, 2013, we lost the right to anything over 15 round mags unless it was grandfathered in. And of course I bought hundreds of magazines for every gun that would be invented for the next decade, mm-hmm. uh, ahead of time just so I wouldn't be affected by this. But. It is out of control, and these laws, once put in place, they don't get repealed. We've tried. We recalled senators. Uh, we've we've done a lot, but we have not been able to get this stupid legislation out of it. Ben, uh, do you want to lose your right to speech? No, and, and my people, as the meme lord, send him your memes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Good God, just start sending this guy hate. Just, just, just add fuel to that fire because, man, that guy probably gets some terrible hate mail needs a laugh and you know maybe one of them will make them laugh yeah oh boy 
it's a it's a disaster. Every town is disappointed to find the NRA is not by the two, is not behind the two A sanctuary movement. They've been submitting all kinds of Freedom of Information Acts. This comes to us from Bearing Arms, and uh, yeah, they they basically have not found any evidence that that has been reported at least that the NRA is behind all of this. And to that I say, well, yeah, I mean, no, it's citizens, and you got to quit saying that the boogeyman which is to them the NRA or whoever whoever it happens to be. Like the boogeyman is not telling them to do this. We are doing this. We are citizens of this great country, and we are done with your nonsense. Ben? Where should I start with this? Um, duh. Or, I mean, the 2A community is kind of a little mad at the NRA right now. Right now. So, uh, uh, of course, this is the citizens speaking up and saying, hey, uh, we need to protect ourselves even more. Let's create sanctuaries to defend ourselves. Because that's the cool thing to do. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Troy? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 people are starting to wake up. I mean, it's taken a long time and it's taken a lot of uh, stupid laws and a lot of uh, uh, everyone telling their friends and family and saying, look, you got to wake up. Uh, this, they're coming for your guns for people to finally get there, but they're finally getting there. That's, that's the important part, but don't let up. Don't, don't slow down. Uh, make sure you're, disseminate this with everyone i mean uh, with with facebook the way they're they're shadow banning and instagram and twitter uh, i'm i'm having to send people emails to get the information out because if we don't have the emails of our listeners uh, they're not going they're not going to hear us on a regular basis and, and so you got to stay plugged in and uh, you got you got to stay active i mean it's it's not it's not uh, ever over it's always going to be a battle until uh, until they take me out of here in a big fat casket, but yeah, you know, it's a continuous battle, and uh, and we do it to try to give our children a better place than we inherited. And so far, I'm losing, but uh, we're trying. Yeah, for sure. Uh, from the full auto news segment, I saw, it looks like Kenny or somebody was uh, putting stuff in here as we went in the show. But let's uh, I'll read all three headlines, and then we'll just chat about them briefly. Florida man arrested for pointing lasers at planes tries to take on police helicopter. New York PD brags about taking dangerous hammerless gun off the streets. And uh, finally, but last but not least, Florida woman tries to set off bomb inside Walmart. Yeah, the guy with the laser pointer, what an idiot. The hammerless gun was basically a, a non-op revolver that they made a big deal about on their social media. But people kind of lit them on fire, which is good. And the Florida woman, just like, I think, you know, if you're if you're going to do something incredibly stupid and illegal... I mean, she just had the idea that she wasn't going to pay for it first. She was just going to gather all the things, uh, but Walmart security and I think a Department of Wildlife official who was off duty in the store uh, were able to stop her before she lit the uh, the device that she had created. But man, uh, Ben, weigh in on those. Well, uh, the Florida woman, I, I actually moved that story into there. Uh, and all I could think of was I've said it a few times on a few different shows was they want to ban guns, but literally I can go into Walmart and make a bomb mm-hmm. and do grave damage. Well, apparently she was listening to me and tried to do it. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> yeah, she got like denatured alcohol and <laughs> nails. She's she all out. <laughs> Troy? Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as the woman wanting to sell the bomb, I mean, a five-gallon can of gasoline, a big lighter can do a lot of damage. Uh, it, it's it's not a, the tool. It's the intent of the person that's, that's going to do the evil act, right? You can't stop evil. You can only react to it. Uh, well, so, the woman was very evil. She had her kid with her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of mental illness out there as well. I mean, you can see that in every article on, on every newspaper just about. But, uh, yeah, the Florida man with the laser pointer was hilarious. He was shoot, he was trying to shine at, at airplanes. So the helicopter got called in. He was shining at the helicopter and they started throwing bottles at him and stuff. And he was at a plant. He was driving a fork truck. Uh, he was at some kind of facility outside. So he must have had a bad night at work or something and started on the bottle a bit early before it was time to get off from work or something. It, it was crazy. Wow. Uh, it does say one of the chopper pi- or one of the pilots actually was hit in the eye with the laser and is having vision problems as a result of the incident. And it was one of the big green later, uh, green lasers as well. So damn, dude. Those are powerful. Yeah. That's pretty nuts. Well, what, a, what an idiot. Yeah. All right. That'll do it for the stories tonight. Before we go, tell people what you've been up to and where they can find you. Troy, I'll start with you. 
Well, we just did a wrap up last night of uh, the rally. Doug that was was with me in Virginia, so we went into pretty good detail about that. So you can find this over at uh, GunGunsPodcast dot com on the Farms Radio Network. All right, I love it, man. Any cool stuff coming up, or just uh, keep keeping on, keeping on? I'm going to the Kentucky rally in Frankfurt on Friday morning. Where there's going to be a bunch of us there from some different militia groups and different pro freedom groups here in Kentucky. Uh, we're hoping to make a big stand and uh, let them know we're we're not for any of this gun control. Love it, man. Ben, how about you? Oh, I've been all over, man. I've got um, a, a new episode of the Civilian Medical Podcast queued up, ready to go. Working on something new at the peak, and then. Um, the off-road podcast we just got back from some snow wheeling so we've got that to talk about here real soon so it's a, a whole bunch of new stuff going on and more guests coming on this week in guns as well all right i love it man thanks for all the hard work you do as well uh guys i'd like to remind you go check out patriot patch company that's patriotpatch.co you can also find second call defense out there with the firearms radio network that's firearmsradio.tv slash scd and that will take you to the website where you can find out more information about that and i believe you get a free month just for signing up I think that'll do it for the news. That's about all my headache can take tonight. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you guys being here. Get over the I, show, show flu. <laughs> I know. I'm trying. You surviving the coronavirus there? Have you been quarantined for long? Yeah, I'm going to get a T-shirt that says, I survived the coronavirus and all I got was this death. <laughs> <laughs> you could bury me in it. Oh, man. Uh, anyway, that'll do for this week. We'll talk to all of you out there next week. Thank you so much. Uh, for sticking around and for listening to the show every single week. We love it. We appreciate you. Uh, this Week in Guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and Ben Allred and is a production of the Firearms Radio Network. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah.